Okay, Joe, let's get the... L it's, always a, it's always our uh, senior alumni who take a while to get the chairs, I know this. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. J just as a uh, background, this is a part of uh, the Darwin celebration. If you recall, it's the 200th anniversary, and the decision was made a number of years ago that uh, every school sponsored a speaker. Who would is this working? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I always have trouble with these, forgive me. And, and we decided, we thought long and hard, and decided we'd invite somebody that really was at the peak of uh, using Darwinian model, apply them to organizations and organizational phenomena. Now, uh, normally when you interview somebody, you have a list in front of you, read out all their accomplishments. And uh, if I did that, I'd be here for an hour and a half with Hagi Rao. I really would. I can tell you about, he is officially Atoll McBean Professor of Organizational Behavior at Stanford. Before that, he was faculties at Northwestern and Emory. He and I were doctoral students together for a while. I can tell you stories about him that will make him blush, even the, which show up even on his brown skin. But I won't go there. But I will tell you this. He is by far the most accomplished researcher that I've run into. He's at the very pinnacle of his work in terms of what he does and how well he's regarded. What's also remarkable about him is he's an exceptional teacher. It's not always easy to be an exceptional researcher, exceptional teacher, and that he is. What tops it off is he can sit in a room full of executives and make it just as much sense as he can at the American Sociological Institute. And that's really what makes him remarkable. My best, the best part of all is he really knows how to tell you a story. <laughs> and so I'll pass it on to him. Hagi, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you all uh, very much for being here, and most importantly for inviting me here. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here because I see very many familiar faces. Uh, it's also a little nervous for me because quite a few of the faces I see are of old professors of mine. Uh, so I do feel a little uh, nervous. Uh, I should tell you, Mohan was very kind when he introduced me, but uh, uh, he was uh, a master teacher for me. I learned many things from him. Uh, not just about the world of ideas, but much more importantly, how to really be as a person who enjoys loving what one does. So it's a great gift that he gave me. Um, there were many other gifts that he gave me, but uh, warmth, generosity, affection. Uh, Mohan was an incredible person, but for him, I probably would never have gotten out of Case Western Reserve. There's also another person sitting right at the back, uh, Eric Nielsen, uh, he was actually the chair of my dissertation committee as well, and he opened my eyes to a new world of ideas I didn't know very much about as well. And the great thing about Eric was, even though I went to him with, I'm sure, very many a stupid series of questions, he was always patient, uh, always eager to kind of listen to me, always helped me to kind of discover what I did. So two wonderful people who, who uh, certainly helped me enormously. I'm deeply grateful uh, to both of them. I would be remiss if I, of course, didn't mention Paul Salipante, who just sort of came in. And, uh, you know, he was, again, another kind professor as well. Um, and Betty, of course, who let me sneak into a number of executive MBA retreats. I did learn the art of drinking cognac, uh, <laughs> which was a very important thing being a poor grad student. So it's in many ways a wonderful homecoming. Uh, I, uh, you know, Case was not just a place where I made friends and I got an education. Case was a, um, a place where perhaps the best thing that ever happened to me was I got married to a graduate of Case too. My wife's a PhD from the Mandel School of Social Sciences, and I readily concede, uh, you know, before this audience, she's clearly the wiser of the two. Uh, you know, and it, truly, she's really, truly the wiser of the two. So Case was very magical. When I come back here, all that I, I sort of think about is uh, the generosity of people, the openness of individuals, and how our eyes were open, not just in the classroom, but when one if one went uh, to the Cleveland Institute of Music, or for that matter, the amazing orchestra. You know, being poor grad students, we'd sit in the nosebleed section. And I can tell you, I learned a lot about classical music going there. So the topic today is Darwin selection and social fitness. As Mohan alluded, much of my work, what I do is I apply, uh, you know, quantitative models to study social change. 
uh, that's sort of what I do. Um, and so when Mohan asked me, you know, when your guru, as they say in India, asks you and says, come and give a talk, you of course got to do it, you know, you, you don't say no. So here I am. So it's a wonderful occasion for me because it made me actually reread the origin of species. Uh, and what I thought I'd kind of begin with is perhaps the core idea of Darwin. And the core idea of Darwin, as he says, is I've called this principle by which each slight variation, which if useful, is preserved by the term natural selection. And Darwin, of course, wrote The Origin of Species in 1859. Moments ago, Paul Salipante and I were just talking about how Darwin and, uh, of course, Lincoln uh, have many things in common, you know, born in the same year and so forth. But uh, more import importantly, oops, uh, more importantly, the year 1959, 1859 was a remarkable year in human history. I was trying to take a look at the most interesting books published in 1859. This admittedly is the outcome of selection, if you will. There were lots of books that were published, many of which we don't remember. So let's look at some of the books. Uh, the Origin of Species by Darwin, The Principles of Political Economy by Karl Marx, Tristan and Isolde by Wagner, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, On Liberty by John Stuart Mill, and Kirchhoff's work on black body radiation. These have all been the things that have stood the test of time, but amongst all of them, undeniably, in terms of intellectual consequence, in terms of profoundly reshaping, as it were, our own ancestry, Darwin clearly stands tall. A very interesting thing about Darwin uh, is, in his autobiography written in 1876, he says, in October 1838, that is, 15 months after I began my systematic inquiry, I happened to read for amusement Malthus on population. And being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence, and he talk, goes on to talk about the fact that the struggle for existence was the central thing that he gleaned from Malthus, the idea of competition and competition being the driver of selection. And his, as he says, here then I had at last got a theory by which to work. It's actually ironic that Darwin, of course, got the idea of uh, com competitive selection from Malthus. And while I won't have time to go into all of this, in preparation for this talk, I was actually reading Alfred Marshall, an old economist, who promptly declared, economics is but a branch of biology. Uh, you know, that was the impact of Darwin at that point in time. Now, one of the interesting things with Darwin, of course, was as he was thinking about competition and selection, his whole argument was members of species seek to reproduce themselves, and those that kind of are able to outcome, uh, overcome, as it were, the struggle for selection, they triumph. On a personal note, Darwin was a person who took reproduction very seriously. He had about seven or eight children, if I recall rightly. Uh, uh, he was a person, clearly, uh, you know, who, was, who wasn't just a theorist in the broad sense of the term. He was a keen observer. He put lots of things into practice. <clears throat> the other interesting thing about Darwin was, Darwin also was a person uh, who was the local magistrate. He was actively involved in the life of the community where he lived. He was a local magistrate. And being a local magistrate, one of the interesting things he did is, in The Descent of Man, which is actually a sequel to his Origin of Species, written in 1871, he has a very interesting section called Natural Selection as Affecting Civilized Nations. He wasn't at that time thinking about corporations, but really about nations. And what he says, of course, is the more efficient causes of progress consist of standards. And what he goes on to say is these standards are embodied in laws, customs, and tradition that are enforced by public opinion. What's very important is Darwin was very attuned to two things. The fact that public opinion hinged, as he put it, on approbation and disapprobation. 
approval and disapproval of people. Those for him were the mechanisms of selection amongst nations. And that's kind of what I want to sort of focus on a little bit. Since Darwin's work, I should add, in the field of sociology, particularly organizational sociology, there has been an enormous uh, uh, vigorous tradition uh, led by my Stanford colleague Michael Hannon and John Freeman of Berkeley. They actually began a paper with a very interesting question, why are there so many kinds of organizations? And what they did was they traced the variety and abundance of organizations, not just to the availability of economic resources, but to culture, approval and disapproval. Since then, three decades of work have shown approval and disapproval matter enormously to organizations. Indeed, in the world of culture, in the world of organizations, and in our world of society. What I'm going to do, given the you know, wide-rangingly diverse audience here, is I'm not going to give a technical talk. I'm instead going to draw on the research that I've done and instead focus, if you will, on a series of stories. My main task today is to do four things. I want to demonstrate that the approval of publics underlies path dependence in social fitness. What do I mean by path dependence? I want to argue that firms get selected not because they do one big thing, but small events in their lives can have big consequences. So, that's kind of how they get selected. That's path dependence. So these events are early. They happen early in a firm's history, and they create a big lock-in effect. I'll argue that these small events create a lock-in effect on reputation, and that's how they help firms survive. I'll actually use the early automobile industry as an example, since this is something I've actually worked on. I should add that I first read the horseless age uh, when I got off on the wrong floor of the Sears library here. That's how I learned about this. The second thing I want to argue is the disapproval of publics also matters. And the disapproval of publics underlies the selection of individuals. Um, and here, and it leads to noisy outcomes. Selection isn't efficient. And here, I want to take you to back to a very interesting episode in American social history. I want you to take you to post-war Hollywood, right after World War II, where there really was a panic about communism. And people were blacklisted in the suspicion that they were alleged communists. So we'll actually kind of draw on some research that I'm doing with my amazing graduate student, uh, who's now at Chicago, Elizabeth Pontikis, and my colleague, Giacomo Negro. Then I want to emphasize how selection isn't smooth, but noisy and contentious. And here, I want to take, if you will, if you grant me a little license, a case of reproduction. This is, if you will, selection at birth. Walmart is thinking of opening stores. They have a proposal on the table. The store hasn't yet taken shape. Communities mobilize in social protest and repel Walmart. We'll actually take a look at that. That's a project that I'm currently involved with, uh, Paul Ingram of Columbia and Laurie Yu of Columbia as well. And finally, if these are three studies based on large-scale empirical projects, I want to close on a very practical note. Because many of you who are in firms, you're concerned with the world of Darwin. How so? You're concerned about how ideas get selected in firms. And what I want to talk about is an amazing firm called Right Solutions, which is based in Rhode Island, that we recently wrote a case study on, and it subsequently merited attention in the New York Times, where what they've done is they've created a marketplace for ideas to minimize the fear of disapproval. In most firms, people are afraid their ideas are going to get shot down. And once you know you're going to be crucified at the murder board, you're not going to come up and share an idea. What these people have done is they've actually circumvented this problem, I think, rather nicely. I also like this firm because the CEO, uh, you know, he's a remarkable person. He, when I first met him, he said, you know, Huggy, I'm not the smartest person in this company. There are many, many other people smarter than me. 
My job is to harvest the genius in my enterprise. So that's, those are the four arguments I want to make. Let me begin quickly with the automobile industry. If you ask most people, how was the automobile industry in America created? They'll immediately latch on to the great man theory of the world. Of course, such a trivial question. Henry Ford created the automobile industry. It is true Henry Ford was a great man, had great consequence. He certainly launched mass production. One reported story suggests that he borrowed the idea of the assembly line by looking at meat packing plants where things were done serially. The real question is not to debate whether Ford is a great person or not. The real question to ask is, what made it possible for him to mass produce cars in 1912? How was a mass demand for the automobile created? And what I want to talk about is, talk a little bit about the automobiling movement driven by auto clubs and how they organized selection, a system of selecting firms so that their reputations were created. In order to drive home this point, let me take you back to the history of the automobile industry. That was the first reaction to the gasoline-powered car. When it first appeared, somebody said, you can't get anyone to sit on an explosion. Now, in the early history of the automobile, there were many names for the car. Look at the names. Motorcycle, Velocipede, Quadricycle, on and on and on. There was no agreement on what the car ought to be called. Little understanding of technologies. Albert Pope, who was the maker of an electric car, said, you can't get anyone to sit on an explosion. There was a law introduced in the Massachusetts legislature that said motorists ought to fire Roman candles as they approached horse-drawn carriages to warn them of their arrival. We might think it's absurd. I can assure you, the pages of the horseless age in 1895-1896, they're replete with this. The car was not reliable. Every car that you bought, it had whip sockets and harness hitches. If it failed, the horse would get it back. Advertisements were misleading. That's what the scientific American said, misleading advertisements. That's the environment in which the car actually began. Now, who could have set this right? Before we get to that, that's a picture of some of the early cars. That's the Duria on the left in 1895. This is Wood's electric Phaeton. VW now has a car called the Phaeton. That's the Stanley Steamer. The Steamer, I might add, flamed out magnificently in a car race, and that was the end of uh, the steamers. Now, how did the car actually become legitimate? How did it become understood? One answer people would give is, this is a straightforward problem. All that you need is a trade association. Well, there were attempts to form trade associations. They failed. Another argument is, look, when there's a problem with the new technology, who's the big buyer? Government. The federal government can be a big buyer. They can establish standards. They can solve the problem. Unfortunately, in America, unlike France, by the time the federal government bought cars or any automated vehicles, it was 1910. The first car in America was produced in 1895. The third answer is a professional society could solve the problem. But the Society of Automotive Engineers established standards much later. The people who stepped into the breach were actually automobile clubs. Who were auto clubs? They were actually self-help societies. People who usually composed these clubs, interestingly enough, were physicians. They were the people who were the first purchasers of cars. They had to move around. They got together in clubs. And these were self-help societies designed to exchange information and protect them from harassment, stone throwing, a whole bunch of problems, and so forth. What these people quickly realized was they realized there was a quality problem. And what the clubs did was they organized races. What kinds of races were they? These were called reliability contests. They consisted of hill climbing runs, climb hill A, climb hill B, endurance runs, go from Cleveland to New York and back. And these contests featured cars likely to be bought by people like you and me. They started in 1895, they ended in 1912. And 
one of the lines used by auto producers was, win on a Sunday, sell on Monday. That's how they acquired reputations. So reliability contests became tests that told consumers about the quality of cars. Buick, for example, won many contests and their advertising campaign was tests tell, could you ask for any more convincing evidence? So here's a picture of the very first race. Chicago downtown to Evanston and back. That's the dirtier car. There were six vehicles competing, two electrics, two gas-powered cars, and you had to go from downtown Chicago to Evanston and back, and the winner was the Duria. The Benz broke down, the electrics broke down, the Duria won. It took the Duria brothers nine hours to win this contest. It was a fantastic achievement at that time. Uh, quickly, the Duria's were immediately kind of projected, as it were, to the front of public consciousness. This is another race. I might add, this is actually a headline. 1901, the horseless age called it the race of the century. Think about it, 1901, they called it the race of the century. And the car in front, that's actually the car of Alexander Winton. Well known, reputable. He'd actually won a lot of endurance runs. And that's Henry Ford to the left. He's actually driving his own car. And in this race, Ford beats Winton and then surges to the front, as it were. So this is a description because Winton's car develops mechanical trouble. Ford was the underdog, but Winton's car developed mechanical trouble. And this is Henry's wife, Clara, writing to her brother. She says, the people went wild. One man threw his hat up, and when it came down, he stamped on it. Another man had to hit his wife on the head to keep her from going off the handle. She stood up in her head seat and screamed, I'd bet 50 on Ford if I had it. <laughs> you know, this gives you a flavor of what these contests were. They were dramatic public spectacles. They were educational kind of enterprises. You just needed to be there. You watched the company win. What did we do? We actually collected data from the horseless age. There, that's a picture. This, by the way, is still, I think, at the case Sears Library. And we collected data from a bunch of directories. And what we wanted to find out was very simple. Did winning races have an effect on car companies? And what's the most dramatic kind of effect? A company ought to survive. It ought not to fail. So we used a number of techniques which I won't sort of get into, and what we found was the following. Firms that won reliability contests lived longer. And the interesting thing was early wins had larger effects than later wins. What mattered was early on in your life as a firm, you had to win. And if you won, then you tended to win more. Uh, then you, they had a bigger effect. Later, we did an analysis, and we wanted to find out, were wins flukes? And it turned out that the rich stayed rich. So if you won a, car, a race early, what you got was publicity. You got reputation. You got more resources. You could enter more races. You could then win more. How did you win the early races? There, the answer depends on a little bit of luck. Whether you won a race or not depended not necessarily on how good you were, but who else participated with you. So if you beat them and you won a couple of races, you quickly got more capital, you got more reputation, and then you were able to develop better cars, and so on and so forth. So this is an example of what in sociology is called the Matthew effect. Uh, you know, the Matthew effect, of course, is from Robert Merton. Uh, for those who have, more will be given to them. That's the Matthew effect. So this is an example, if you will, of social fitness. It wasn't that efficient or better quality car companies won necessarily. It's simply that companies that won early races tended to actually do better because they could win later races because they had a virtuous cycle kind of going. 
So first part of the argument, social fitness matters. And it mattered decisively in the automobile industry. By the way, after 1912, there were no reliability contests because by then the car was already accepted. Everybody knew. And Ford could venture into mass production because Ford was one of the repeated winners of these contests. So that's why he could say, you know what? I'll make lots of cars. People are going to buy that. So mass production was feasible because of social fitness, if you will. Let me turn to the next argument or the next example. And this is a, a very interesting period in Hollywood from 1945 to 1960. In Hollywood, <clears throat> in post-war Hollywood, there was um, what can be called a moral panic. Moral panics are things where you have groups of people who raise anxiety about a social problem. It could be any problem. It could be climate, for example, or it could be you know, autism, whatever the problem. So here, the moral problem was communism. And what happened in Hollywood has been likened to an inquisition. So people were put on the blacklist. What was the blacklist? Your name was in a list of suspected communists, and that meant you couldn't get a job. That was it. You were completely frozen out. What's interesting is, from 1945 to when the blacklist started to 1960, when the blacklist ended. The blacklist ended in 1960 because Dalton Trumbo then acknowledged his name as the screenwriter for an amazing movie called Spartacus. The Kennedys also went and saw Spartacus. So that was kind of, if you will, the closing of the chapter on the blacklist. So during that period of time from 45 to 60, we found that there were roughly 38,000 artists working in Hollywood. 5,700 films were made, and less than 300 people were put on the blacklist, which means less than 1%. And I won't bore you with the details here, but many of these people were actually who were small time players. Of course, there was Dalton Trumbo, of course, there were the Hollywood Ten, but many of them were small time players, people we won't recognize. So the interesting question is, if so few individuals were punished, negatively selected, they were socially unfit because they were supposed to be alleged communists, how did the blacklist actually exert social control? What was the real consequence of the blacklist? What was the mechanism of negative selection? Because it's only 300 people, not very many. What we argue and what we show in a paper that's currently out there is that it was guilt by association. It's not these 300 people who mattered. What mattered was whether if you worked with them. That was what mattered. Now, let's actually take a look at this. As early as the 30s, who was called a communist? If you held that Nazi Germany was a threat to America, you know, at that time, ironic as it may seem, you would label the communist. And if you said civil liberties ought to be protected, some people labeled you a communist. So there was, of course, quite a bit of anti-union activity. And you had the Motion Picture Association for the Preservation of American Ideals, Walt Disney, John Wayne, all of these people quickly formed this together. And what they did was they basically turned over 22 names to the House Committee on Un-American Activities. These people asked 10 artists to testify, and when they refused to testify, the Hollywood 10 were quickly put on the blacklist. Dalton Trumbo, Alfred Maltz were the early guys there. Some people, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, actually supported the Hollywood 10, but quickly had to recant. All it took to get on the blacklist was you had to be simply issued a subpoena by the House Un-American Committee's Acti uh, Un-American Activities Committee. You could also be gray listed. There's a book called the uh, Gray Channels. Uh, you know, uh, the Red Channels. Sorry. And what was amazing was the power of the blacklist was such that people said, "Hey, if you feature a movie with any of Stalin's little creatures, we're going to boycott it." It was so powerful. Now, that was the blacklist per se. And the blacklist had tragic consequences. One tragic consequence, uh, oops, um, 
was people had to abandon their careers. Writers could use aliases. So you could actually have a nom de guerre, as it were, a new name. But if you were an actor, you were stuck. You had one face. And that was what Zero Mostel said. I'm a man of thousand faces, all of them blacklisted. And as somebody said, during this period, if you were on the blacklist, you never, ever got a job. But one of the most tragic things that we read is a, a very moving letter by Dalton Trumbo. So Trum Trumbo is writing to the headmistress of the school where he has a young daughter, Mitzi, studying. And she actually is ridiculed because of her father's reputation. I can't read this because if I read it, I actually begin to tear up. Please read it if you can. I hope all of you can see it. So as he says, the principles of what they do, uh, what they say, Mitzi is what they do. And he talks about the bravery of his daughter seeking to do what she has uh, actually done. Now, very moving, very profoundly moving, a young girl kind of going through this. What's happening to her? Guilt by association. She didn't choose Dalton Trumbo to be her dad. It so happened he was her dad. She had no choice. Now, of course, if you actually talk to social psychologists, many of the experiments they do has to do with this kind of stigma, guilt by association. And the way it works in a classical experiment is you actually have a group of people who are asked to hire a candidate for a job. And this candidate, in the control condition, you're simply asked to sit next to somebody of equal height, same gender, all of that. In the treatment condition, that same person, exactly the same person, is asked to sit next, this time, to an obese female. And then people are asked, how likely are you to hire this person? The qualifications are the same. The resume is the same. It's amazing when you sit next to a person who is obese. In this instance, an obese female, your attractiveness for the job actually goes down. People don't want to hire. It's got nothing to do with you. It's got to do with the fact of stigma by association. Even the most casual of associations, you're sitting next, in this case, to an obese individual is effect enough to doom your chances in the market. Now in the experiment, of course, you know that the person is obese and therefore likely to be stigmatized. What we argue is stigma can also travel backward. And that's what happened in Hollywood. How did that work? The three of us worked in a movie. And what happened was, at the time when we worked in a movie, nobody got blacklisted. But after we worked in a movie, I get blacklisted. What's the effect on these two gentlemen? OK? Now, if we have stigma by association, they are going to suffer. What's our measure of how they're going to suffer? Nobody's going to give them a job. So it's not the 283 people who were on the list. It's everybody who worked with them before they got on the blacklist. Obviously, if you worked with them after they got on the blacklist, you know, it's a completely different story. What matters is, before they got on the blacklist, you worked with them, and it boomerangs on you. What did we find in our study? We actually gathered these data over a long period of time, 47 to 1960. We did a number of uh, you know, analyses, which I won't sort of go into. Um, we start in 45. We end in 1960. Uh, and um, what do we find? We find stigma by association propagates backwards. If artist A works with colleagues in a movie, and it, those colleagues are put on the blacklist, A's job prospects are harmed. And the amazing thing was, A is going to suffer from impaired job prospects if he has one such connection. Of course, if you work with lots of people, you're going to suffer even more. But even one connection, you work in one movie with one person, and that person gets put on the blacklist, guess what? It actually boomerangs on you. The other thing we found, much to our surprise, is 
usually ideas, images, innovations, they diffuse among similar people. So people, so things spread among people of similar age, similar gender, similar qualifications, similar roles and so forth. In sociology, this is referred to as homophily. What we find is heterophily. When guilt by association spreads, it spreads amongst dissimilar people. So if you're an actor, and I work with Fred Colopy here, and Fred is a writer, I don't even see Fred, maybe. But Fred's put on the blacklist as a communist. Guess what? I'm going to suffer in the labor market. I'm sorry, Fred. Uh, you were, as they say, it's the availability heuristic kicking in. You were available. Um, the other thing that we found was high status actors also actually were harmed. If you won an Oscar, it's true, you suffered less than others, but still you suffered. And who else suffered? If you were in the top 10 screen credits, you still suffered. So it's not the Matthew effect, it's if you will, uh, the Job effect. From those who have, things are being kind of taken away, if you will. Now, some of you might argue, and we won't get into these technical details here, some of you might argue, you know what? Of course, people who were communists worked with other communists, you know? Uh, so that's kind of what happened. So we actually do a number of analyses. We show first people who suffer from this guilt by association, they actually weren't members of communist organizations. They also didn't get blacklisted themselves. They simply suffered from guilt by association. We use a number of other statistical techniques that I won't sort of go into, but I'm happy to sort of talk about. But this is an example of selection at work. By the way, don't just think that this only operates in Hollywood. My co-authors and I, we did an experiment. And in the experiment, we actually got uh, our respondents. You had one control condition, two treatment conditions. We first asked people, how good do you think on a scale of 0 to 5 is winning the Nobel Prize? So they said 4.2. So it's a good thing, good for the image. How bad do you think is it to be convicted of a felony? On a scale of 0 to minus 5, they said it was 3.8. So it's very important to keep in mind that it's not just that the felony is bad, but the felony is a weaker stimulus than winning the Nobel. The Nobel is actually the stronger sort of stimulus. So we got a bunch of people in, uh, both executives as well as students. And uh, we simply told the control group, here's Donald Baird. This is the guy's Vita. You're going to be setting up a biotechnology company. How likely are you to put him on the board of your biotech company? And who's Donald? He's vice president R&D at Genentech. And we give him some details. And then we say, by the way, we'll show you a picture of Don. Here's Don. He's at the BioVenture Forum. He's standing next to four people. And those four people are registering themselves alphabetically. So they're not friends of Don. They're actually people registering. They all have the last name starting with a B. So the control group, they tell you how much they likely they are to hire Baird. To a treatment group, we say, everything is the same thing. And then we say, you know, and we tell even the control group, by the way, the guy standing to the left of Donald Baird is some guy called John Campbell. John's actually vice president R&D at Amgen or whatever it is. To the treatment group, exactly the same thing. Everything is the same. Only thing is at the end we say, you know, six months later, the guy standing to the left of Baird, Campbell, he won the Nobel Prize. How likely are you to choose Baird to be on your board? No effect. Exactly the same thing to another treatment group, same guy on the left. And here we give again an update saying, six months after the picture was taken, the guy on the left was convicted of a felony for misbranding drugs. Guess what? They don't like, they don't like Baird. They say he's untrustworthy. They say he's incompetent, all because you stood next to a guy who gets convicted of a felony six months after the picture is taken. That's the power of guilt by association. It can also work backward. That's selection at work, social fitness, if you will, 
And that's the kind of consequence. I should tell you, by the way, in fact, I go back uh, uh, tomorrow to Stanford, and the day after tomorrow, I actually teach a class uh, in our executive program for the directors of uh, independent companies. And one of the things I do is I give them a case on choosing a chief financial officer for the company. It's astonishing. 45 minutes, it's amazing how the best candidate gets dropped off the radar screen. I'm not joking, in 15 seconds flat. That's the amount of time they spend on that person. I'm not saying they should select the person. They may have good reasons to select two other people. But 15 seconds on this person seems to me to be an awfully short period of time. Uh, you can see what goes on uh, in the corporate suite. Talk about selection of personnel. Um, selection and noise. This is, uh, selection isn't smooth, it's contentious. In the social world, there's kind of heat. Uh, there's, you know, contestation. And uh, Forbes, some time ago, actually asked a very interesting question. Who's Walmart's biggest enemy, or who is their biggest rival? And, you know, if you look at the, you know, uh, retail stores, you know, in the segment that Walmart is in, Carrefour is the next one. But the Forbes article said this guy was the biggest enemy. Who's he? A guy called Al Norman. What did Al Norman do? He actually launched a movement in Greenfield, Massachusetts to actually make sure that Walmart could not open a store in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Now think about this. There is no central organization taking Walmart on. By the way, here, you know, I'm a social scientist. I'm not expressing a value judgment here on whether it's a good thing for Walmart to open a store or not. I certainly am aware of the literature, and we can talk about that. There are studies that say, yes, it's good. There are studies that say, yes, it's bad. But, you know, my view is I'm simply interested in chronicling, if you will, noise and selection. So the interesting thing here is this is a case of selection at birth. They haven't yet established a store. They're thinking about establishing a store, what happens? So a very important thing to keep in mind is the competition is asymmetric. Walmart is so powerful, so centralized, so brilliantly coordinated, so efficient. These guys are all decentralized. They're all in lots of little communities. So these community people are taking on a strong centralized foe. Now, if I talk to my colleagues in political science, one of whom was at Northwestern and the other is who is now at Stanford, you know, and I ask them, hey, what kind of model can you write as political economists about this kind of private politics, a movement targeting a specific firm? They'll tell you, they'll actually tell you, look, if we construct a formal econometric model, protests should be rare. You shouldn't find any protest. Why is that so? Because if you're a smart activist, you're going to pick a target who is going to give in before you protest. They're going to say, hey, what do you want us to do? We'll do what you want to do. Don't protest. But if you're another kind of firm, you're going to be so tough, nobody's going to mess with you. So either case, you shouldn't have any protest, right? If you have protests in terms of that economic model, protests should be rare miscalculations. Well. Let's take a look at the data. From 1998 to 2005, Walmart issued 1,566 proposals to open new superstores. Out of this, 64% had no protest. 36% attracted protests. So it's hard to say protests are rare when in one third of the cases they're happening. You can't also say they're ubiquitous. It's not like they're happening everywhere. It's only one third of the time. Of the 558 cases of protests, Walmart fails two-thirds of the time, roughly. One-third of the time, Walmart wins. So these data cast doubt on the idea that the activists are choosing an easy target. There's a fight. Walmart, you know, it's a company that doesn't kind of give in easily. So in fact, let me give you a short story. This actually happened, by the way. It happened in a small little town called Damariscotta, Maine. It's a town of roughly 12 to 1,400 people. And they realized Walmart was going to open a store, a supercenter. And supercenters vary in their size. 
roughly between 120,000 square feet to 220,000 square feet. Varies by size of town and so forth. So two young women quickly realized this and said, my God, they're going to open a store. And very quickly, they begin to organize a movement. And they get a group of people together. What do they do? The first thing they say is, let's actually get people together. Let's do a study. Walmart is doing a study of its own to show that it won't harm Main Street. These people do their own study. They get a professor to do it. And that study shows, yes, it's going to harm Main Street. Now, you can argue about the studies and so on and so forth. The fact is, there's noise. Is it going to harm? Walmart study says yes. The rival study says, uh, you know, Walmart study, sorry, says no harm, actually benefit. The rival study says harm uh, and no benefit. What's interesting is, very quickly, these people begin to mobilize support. Walmart also is mobilizing support. These are called astroturf groups. You know, there's a front group, typically, of people in the community. They have placards. They're marching. They're doing all of these things. But this community group, they create an organization called Our Town. And they quickly get together. The thing they realize, interestingly, is even if they defeat Walmart in their town, all that Walmart will say is, OK, you don't want us here? Fine. We'll locate 15 miles away from you in another town. And guess what? It's still going to actually have the effect it did. So they quickly realized they had to reach out to the other towns and to create a regional area. So you have to create a complete area where you can't enter. So in this case, they created three, four areas. So in each place, Walmart is being repelled. And their suggestion was put something to vote. What was it they put to vote? A zoning rule. They didn't object to a store. What they objected to was the size of the store. So the, 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 the referendum, if you will, was vote on the motion that we'll allow a new store to be built, but the store ought not to be more than 35,000 square feet. Once you do that, Walmart is no longer interested. It's too small, a bunch of other things. They sort of go off. What did we do? This gives you an idea of all the places that Walmart proposed a super center. You can see the spread. You know, it's all over the country, but certainly quite a bit of concentration in the Northeast. That's where there were protests. Again, all the, in red, all over the country. But again, concentration in some areas, even in the South. And eventually, that's what, where Walmart opened the store. So again, we do a number of, uh, uh, you know, statistical specifications. Um, and what we do is, what's kind of important is to actually take a look at the people protesting. This is a guy called James Kunstler. He's an extreme viewpoint. We have, we're not saying we agree with this viewpoint necessarily, but just to give you a flavor of what it is. Here's Kunstler who says, people who shop at a giant discounter to save seven bucks on a hairdryer don't realize they're paying a hidden price by taking the business from local merchants, because those are the merchants who sit on school boards, sponsor little league teams, and support the civic institutions that create a community. Kunstler, again, at the TED conference in the Bay Area, the technology conference, he says, we have 38,000 places that are not worth caring about in the United States today. When we've had enough of them, we're going to have a nation that's not worth defending. And I want you to think about that. When you think about these young men and, men and women who are over in places like Iraq, spilling their blood in the sand, ask yourself, what's their last thought of home? I hope it's not the curb cut between the Chuck E. Cheese and the Target store, because that's not good enough for Americans to sp be spilling their blood for. That's the kind of passion all of this kind of evokes. So we looked at all the places in America. These are census places, places where Walmart issued a proposal, where protests occurred, did not occur. Was there a store opening or not in both categories of places? What do we find? Oops. So we find that Walmart protests against Walmart are more likely to occur in places where you have a lot of ethnic homogeneity. 
If there's a lot of ethnic heterogeneity, it's hard to create an identity around a small town. Occupational homogeneity is important. People need to be working in the same occupations. Education, of course, is correlated. Most importantly, protests actually occur in a given place when there are protests in the neighboring place. It's like a virus of protest or a contagion. And where do protests succeed in reducing store openings? Primarily when there are protests in neighboring areas. Because there's no point preventing Walmart from coming to your small town. You got to make sure that the entire area around your town, the four or five towns or whatever it is, uh, you know, they all sort of seal off Walmart. Interestingly, Walmart, when they open a store in any community, they give a donation. And in cases where they opened a store, overcame a protest and opened a store, they donated about 10% more money to a place. Interestingly, the kinds of things they donate money, Little League, all the community things, the fire stations, those are the things that they actually kind of give their money to. So the protesters, of course, you know, they succeed in pushing them back, preserving small towns, Main Street, all of that. And uh, this is a case, if you will, of selection and social fitness. Are, are big box stores good or bad? Now, if you talk to the protesters, which we did, their argument is we protest against Walmart because once we allow a Walmart to come in, other big box stores are going to come in. Very quickly, you're going to have Target and Best Buy and this and that, congestion and parking and you know fast food. and They actually have architectural templates. There's also an effect on real estate prices when all of this happens. Uh, you know, I'm sure all of you are aware of that. So this is a story of selection at birth. Again, social fitness. What does social fitness mean? Does it actually fit a community's sense of what they need? What kind of matters to them? This is a case of approval. So let me kind of close with um, oops. the last sort of episode here. The, the three studies I pointed to, they're actually based on empirical research, large-scale data collection, and the like. I'm happy to give you technical details of these studies later. Here, I want to actually talk about a simple case study that, but nevertheless, I hope you think it's as interesting as it was for me. It's actually about the selection of ideas within a firm. One of the problems in firms is they emphasize what can be called or they undertake or espouse a murder board approach to innovation. What does that mean? You have an idea, you go to the murder board. What's the murder board going to do? They're going to kill your idea. It's not that don't get me wrong, a bunch of ideas need to be killed in companies too, you know. It's not that that's necessarily a bad thing to do. The problem is, how is it done? And what's interesting is, when people kind of get killed in the murder board, not just the ideas, very quickly other people say, wait a minute, there's no point even kind of coming up with ideas because we're going to be slaughtered. And that's kind of where you have a failure of collective intelligence. So this is a Darwin problem, selection. Here, what is happening is selection is driving out variation. So you want to make sure new ideas have to do with new variations. So you want to make sure selection, whatever selection you create, it's reasonably, reasonably open to variation. So anyway, here's a company. This is based in Rhode Island. They're in the computer visualization business. They have two primary clients, Department of Defense, actually the Navy, uh, what they do for the Navy is they write visualization software. So if you're a terrorist, you're trying to put an explosive near a ship or something, they've got stuff that will not only find you, but fry you too. Uh, you know, once I found that out, I said, okay, I don't think I'm <laughs> that interested in this. The other thing they do is visualization software for the casino industry. So the CEO and the COO, they actually told me, you know, we're not the smartest people here. There's a lot of people who are far smarter than us. So I said, what's your job? He said, my job is to actually harness their collective genius. So what they've done in their company is they've created a stock market for ideas. It's a different kind of market. It's not just a prediction market. It's more than that. Let me show you what they've done. Every employee in the company is given $10,000 of opinion money. So you can buy stocks or savings bonds. And 
So you need to answer four or five questions, but for you to list an idea on the market, you need to get the support of one person. They call them prophets. They're 40 middle and senior managers. Their argument is, if you can't even get one other person to sign on, that tells you you've got a real problem with your idea. You've got to get one person to sign on, and then you get the stock listing. And anybody else can buy the stock. They can offer suggestions in a discussion thread. They can volunteer time. Okay? So what can they do? They can actually do buy stock, give suggestions, or volunteer time in any of these three categories. One is what they call a savings bond, cost-saving idea. The other is they call this category Bow Jones. That means you're using existing clients, but you're giving new technology, new products to existing clients. By the way, the last one should be SPASDAC, not SPASDAW. They call it SPASDAC, new clients and completely far out technology. Now, I want you to understand that the people doing this, they're not playing this game all the time. They have real jobs, real deadlines, real projects, real clients, everything real. In fact, if you look at when they play this game, most of the time it's at home after they put the kids to bed, usually. You can actually see when they log in and they log out and do all of these things. So it's interesting, and you can, we can have a debate you know, about this. Some people sort of say, well, maybe the company should give them time to play on the ideas. Google apparently does. But when I talk to people in Google, Google's, you know, and they're down the street from where we are. They, officially, the policy is 80% you work, 20% time to work on your projects. But when you ask them, they look at you as though you're a crazy guy, and they say it's more like 120%. 100% real job, on top of that 20% innovation. And so these guys say, look, you better do it on your own time. Now, what's very interesting about this is you know that an idea is a bad idea when people don't buy your stock. You know your idea is a good idea when people buy stock. Most importantly, when people give suggestions and people volunteer. And what the top guys do is they look at the top 20 stocks, and that's when they come with adventure capital. So I asked the CEO, why don't you pick which are the best? He says, I'm not smart enough to do that. If these guys have figured out the top 20 ideas, I know there are legs. People are willing to work on them. There are discussion threads. By the way, the CEO can actually pull up on his computer screen all the best citizens in the company. Who are the best citizens in the company? People who actually give suggestions, people who volunteer to work on other people's projects. They get a little reward, too, and so forth. So what's kind of interesting, by the way, is after I met the CEO, he asked me, who else would you like to meet? I said, I'd like to meet the receptionist. He looked at me and he said, receptionist? Why? He said, well, I want to find out if this person has an idea. So he smiled and he said, sure. I'm not joking. I went to the receptionist. The receptionist actually had two savings bonds ideas that were doing very well in the stock market. Maybe you, all of you have been to companies where people think receptionists are people with ideas. I've been to very few such companies. I was blown away. Now, what's interesting is these savings bonds ideas are very simple. Well, you know, one thing is somebody might come and say, hey, we're writing a bunch of software. Why are we doing this? With, why are we paying the telecoms all this money? We'll actually have our own PABX system, savings bond. Somebody else might come and say, wait a minute. You know what? We could sell it to our casinos, lots of customers. We can do the PABX for them. That becomes a Bow Jones. So these aren't silos. Things move back and forth. Now, what about SPASDAC ideas? SPASDAC ideas come because, I said, how did they come about? And so the guy said, well, the CEO said, because people solve real problems. I said, where? In their work? He said, that or maybe in their life. I said, what do you mean? He introduced me to this very bright software designer, young lady. So he said, why don't you go talk to her? So I talked to her. So she was. She has two kids, I think grade seven and grade three. The kid in grade seven came to her and said, Mom, I have to do a class in my school on soils. And soils are such a terribly boring subject. Can you make it interesting? So the mom thinks about it and says, you know, we got a software engine. She rigs up a version of a bingo game 
where they can actually play the game and learn about soils of different kinds. You know, people asking questions, giving answers, and the like. Works really great. She says, huh. And then she tries it with the third graders. She does another thing. And the third grade teacher says, this is the best day of my life in school. <laughs> and I'm not joking. She puts it on the stock market. It does well. It's incredible as a story. Within a week, they sold that idea to Hasbro for a million dollars. You know the amazing thing? Right Solutions offices are exactly four miles from the huge R&D facility Right Solutions has in Rhode Island. Four miles. I looked at them and said, wait a minute. Are you saying that Hasbro was not on your radar screen as a customer? They looked at me and said, no. But I said, they're only four miles away. I said, they said, yeah, I know. But we only thought of the Navy. We only thought of casinos. And today, they're actually doing this for? And right now, what are they doing? Every idea they come up with, they actually have got a VC guy whom they've hired. He actually shrink wraps it as an idea. And they sell the idea. They make money. They distribute it. By the way, you don't get paid just because you came up with the idea. You get paid depending on the lifting that you do. Because I can come up with an idea and say, hey, it's a cool thing to do, but I don't know how to write the code. Whoever wrote the code actually gets a big share. So they make sure that's done, that's done in a transparent way. So this is actually the headlines that people see on their computer screen when they log into work or at home. And with the CEO's permission, I'm actually showing you the portfolio he sees. The CEO is a remarkable guy called Jim Lavoy. This is his portfolio. You can see savings bonds, Bow Jones, FASDAC. And if you add all of this up, the value of the stock is more than $10,000. Why is that? As other people buy the stock, as other people volunteer, the value of the stock increases. For those of you trained in the Chicago brand of economics, there's no short selling in this market. You can't short somebody else's stock. So, uh, <laughs> I, And the amazing thing, they've actually made this idea into a product. They're actually selling it to consulting firms. And you know what? I said, how is it doing? The first client, I think, is Sabre. They've got it, and they got a bunch of other people. So I said, what do consulting firms do? How is it going? And he says, that's the problem, Professor. He said, all these firms, they take this, and they want to surround it with a lot of process. And he says, don't get me wrong. Process is not a bad thing. But when you have too much process, my worry is you'll have a lot of process and no innovation which is, of course, a real idea. So here's an, uh, you know, a quick graph that tells you how many people participated. And people participate, by, as I said, by volunteering, doing a bunch of things. This is a firm with offices in Rhode Island, San Diego, and Connecticut. It's a small company. Right now, at the time when we closed the case, they had 50 plus stocks on their market. That's not bad for a firm with 125, 130 people. Think about it. That's a lot of ideas. Ideas ready to go, and they don't need to implement all of them. They'll actually sell it to other people who can do it. He's actually made this into an interesting kind of idea factory. So, uh, very fascinating uh, case study uh, you know, in terms of uh, what they've done. Remember, this is not a prediction market. Microsoft, Google, uh, you know, has a bunch of markets where people predict things. Is Microsoft going to buy Yahoo? They have 52 such markets. And what they find is very few people participate in these markets. It's actually the same guys participating in them. And ironically, Microsoft has a market. Do you know for what? To actually predict the actual release date of software. Because when the boss asks you, Hey, when is the software going to be re released? What are you going to say? Tomorrow. <laughs> or it got released yesterday. And they know it's never going to happen. So they got a market that actually tells them, is it going to be a month down? Is it going to be two months? They're looking at the market to find out, hmm, which stock are people buying? <laughs> if a lot of people are saying two months down, maybe that's what's going to be the real release date. Tells you what's happening in an organization like that. So those are all for the purposes of prediction. Here. It's actually a very clever engagement tool. It's more than to predict. People are actually coming up with ideas. People are actually sharing them. And it's a lovely example, in my view, of how 
they I think have made a good step to solve the Darwin problem. So, what's the upshot of all of this? We went through four examples. Early automobiles in America, 1895 to 1912. Here, winning a race, the first win was a you know, small event, but it had big effects. What was the big effect? It allowed you to live longer, allowed you to get capital, certainly allowed you to win more races and develop a reputation. Disapproval also is a form of social fitness, guilt by association and selection in Hollywood. Doesn't matter whether you're on the blacklist, all that it matters is whom did you work with even before the guy got on the blacklist. And guess what? There's this reverse effect in time. Another example of social fitness, Walmart, and here contention underlies selection. This is selection at birth, new stores aren't being open. And the last one, Right Solutions, is an example of a firm that's actually grappled with the Darwin problem. Let's not set up a selection system that drives out idea generation. They've actually calibrated it in a clever way. So I thought I'd kind of give you this kind of overview, and hopefully you can see how close Darwin is to all of this. Darwin isn't a historical figure out there in 18, uh, born in 1859. Darwin was a keen observer. Uh, he, in a sense, observed animals with the zeal of an anthropologist, categorized them with the skill of a taxidermist, if you, uh, you know, or a classificationist. And he was also a person who generated theories by observing the real world. But his whole thing was about selection. And I think what's kind of very important for us to understand is we all grapple with selection. We run a company, you have to think about what's the system of selection. You choose people, what's the system of selection there? Virtually everything that we do, it all has to do with selection. Uh, in fact, uh, I should tell you at uh, Stanford Business School, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we actually spend a lot of time selecting faculty. For us, that's the single most important thing that we do. And of course, uh, you know, selecting students and the like. So uh, Darwin has, therefore, a little bit to do with democracy as well. And I think uh, that, if you will, is the interesting thing that this particular story of right solutions kind of conveys to us. So hopefully, I've kind of conveyed, uh, given you a flavor of Darwin and the Darwinian ideas being present not just in American social history, but contemporaneously. Uh, Walmart, for example, but much more importantly in our daily lives. If we can do that more mindfully rather than mindlessly, I think we've made a big, we've taken a big step forward. You've all been very kind listening to me patiently. Thank you so very much, and I'm happy to entertain questions. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. The short answer is, uh, uh, you're right, there were actually more than 1,200, depending on how you defined a producer, whether you were incorporated or whether you had a model for sale. And if you actually assume it's a model for sale, the numbers go up a little bit more. Not by a huge amount, but in a margin. In analyses that we haven't done, what we actually sort of, do in, which I didn't sort of get into, is we actually account for all of those things. Regions, size of horsepower of engine, you know, various ways in which you can kind of segment as well. In spite of all of that, these wins actually make a difference. In analyses that I haven't gotten to, one of the things that I also, because remember, many of these contests early on were asymmetric. It's not like they're having a contest for 30 HP cars, you know, or only two cylinder cars. Any kind of car could compete. It was much later that things became much more sort of standardized. So even if you account for horsepower, if you account for cylinder design, source of power, winning matters. But there is a little catch, and that little catch is one interesting consequence of this is the gasoline-powered car triumphed. Electric cars 
couldn't simply climb hills quick enough, even though they were the best for women. Talk about a segment. Uh, you know, it never took off. Steam cars were the fastest. In fact, uh, there's a lovely thing about the Stanley steamer touching huge speeds. The unfortunate problem with steam cars was in a couple of races, they kind of exploded. Not kind of exploded, but exploded. And so when you have a vivid, powerful explosion, that was the end of the Stanley steamer. It was the fastest car, but three explosions, people said, there's no way I'm going to buy a Stanley steamer. And today, the tragedy is the Stanley steamer, such a fine company, it's now the name of a carpet cleaning company. <laughs> so it's a tragedy, I think. Uh, it's a tragedy. I personally would have loved to see a steam car. There's a fantastic museum here, by the way, the Crawford Museum. I should add that there were many hours I found myself gazing at uh, some of the, it's a beautiful city. Look at the museums. I mean, I spent a lot of time there, too. You know, if you're a graduate student with little money, there are a lot of things you can do in this neighborhood. <laughs> yes, yeah. For the science of the biology, right. Uh -huh. I saw the, the analogy right. sequencing, and the effect of the Darwin, Darwin theory right. that a mutation occurred, a right. change, right. which was then advantageous to the species, right. and the species would live because it right. was a winner. Right. Okay, so in the business sense, however, many mutations, however, can be disadvantaged Very mutations, true. and the species would die. They mm -hmm. wouldn't live on. Mm -hmm. That's, they weren't a survival mm -hmm. mutation. If a CEO an idea, mm -hmm. like, like an electric car, right. which might otherwise not survive in competition today, but takes that mutation right. and protects that idea, right. then he may have something later on. Right. So that the CEO may actually have a role right. in avoiding survival of the fitness right. fit, of the fittest. Very true. Uh, you raise actually a very interesting and <coughs> profound, very profound point. I mean, two of them. One is, part of what you're suggesting is be careful of how often you change. Because one of the things we've, many of my colleagues have shown is when you change, you can die too. Because it's a hard thing to execute the changes, we all know. The other portion I think that you're alluding to is equally important. That is, one of the things that C savvy CEOs do is, as you point out, they shield ideas from premature evaluation. And I think uh, it's so very true. And that's kind of... Uh, well, you know, in fact, one of the things that they do by isolating idea development, putting it someplace else, is not just you isolate the people working. Well, that's important, but you're also shielding. You know, so the shielding part is an important thing. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Uh, actually, I'm going from this question. I mean, biology we don't recognize teleology. Right. Nothing is teleological. Right. Of course. Whereas, I mean, in the real world, right. we do have control. And right. All these things, but then mutations are happening mm -hmm. all the time. Uh -huh. So, how much are the CEOs that you have known conscious about these things that are happening? Uh -huh. that's, that's, I, that's, that's a good question. <coughs> Lots of times, um, how should I put it? Um, things that happen by sheer accident, you know, things that kind of happen, you know, that were purely kind of fortuitous. They're very, very important. We all know about the sweetener example. I think it was NutraSweet. It started for one thing. You know, there are many, many other examples. Things originally made for one purpose quickly succeed for a completely different kind of purpose. And that's one of the things to kind of make sure you're able to do that. I think uh, what's kind of important is, you're right, it's hard to be goal-directed, or as you say, purposive and kind of teleological yeah. in that sense. What's kind of important, I think, is you can do lots of subtle things to kind of facilitate, if you will, the physics of interaction, the, you know, and if you will, the chemistry of interaction. It's amazing. Where I sit in the business school, we actually don't sit by areas. You know, it's not like accounting people sit in one corner, finance people like that. We all are kind of jumbled up, and it's amazing how often we kind of go across uh, to each other's offices. Uh, you know, right now, one of the things I do is I facilitate a group of uh, professors. Uh, we all are talking about one question. Is the market for CEOs broken at the recruitment end? And you know who's in the conversation? Finance people, accounting people, organization behavior people, 
economics people. Why are we able to do that? A lot has to do with where we sort of sit. So I think all of that kind of matters uh, sort of quite a bit too. So physical space, even things like that, can have certainly a big consequence. Uh, you can be clear of the outcome, uh, but you can certainly, it can certainly have big effects on other things. Any other uh, comments? Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. That's a yeah. No, that's a very good question that you ask. Um, we actually were very cognizant of this, uh, in particular because there was a pronounced anti-Semitic bias, if you will, to this uh, guilt by association. One of the things we kind of uh, all what we've been able to do is take a step and say, if you actually there's actually occupational specialization. So, you know. If you actually take where people of the Jewish faith were more disproportionately, con <coughs> disproportionately concentrated in, they more often tended to be writers. Who were the artists? More often, if you will, Gentiles. And what's interesting is, you know, as I just showed you, it was heterophilous. So even if an artist worked with somebody who was actually, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a writer, the art, the actor still suffered as well. So it wasn't, uh, if you will, purely localized that way. Uh, in parallel, another common sort of question is, was it, if you will, anti-gay, if you will? You know, that's the other sort of, we've again done a number of analyses to sort of show, no, that's why there was this panic, that's why there was the fear, because it was, if you will, so indiscriminate. And that's the whole thing of the panic, and that's why it had a big effect. There was somebody else with a question? Have you talked about Ford having sort of rolled out after all this right. races took right. place? So didn't they also add an effect to that rather than just writing out the reliability and so on was done? Or did they also establish that in some way? Who established that? Uh, Ford, when they started out, right. had all this already been done? Yes. They yeah, they act, yes. They actually won a lot of races before they started mass production. It was only when the Ford, uh, you know, they, were, they came out, they had a strong... There was this survival of reputations, if you will. They were able to do this. Otherwise, many people actually did simple assembly. Ford couldn't have actually done the mass production that he did until much later. Any other? Uh, but uh, didn't Ford have a cost advantage? Sure. Because of the mass production? Right. I mean, Very true. But it was much later. So the learning curve and learning through doing, you know, all of those things are very true. All I'm sort of suggesting is Ford certainly had a cost advantage that enabled Ford to succeed after 1912. All I'm saying is what allowed him to get into mass production, you know, cost advantage might very well have been a calculation, but his ability to sell depended on, you know, the public's kind of opinion or their perceptions of how reliable Ford cars were. I mean, you could, pr you could have produced lots of cars, might have been cheap, nobody might have bought them. Of course, this is, you know, we're kind of arguing kind of backward uh, here. But you're right that there certainly was a cost advantage post-establishing the thing. There was somebody else? Yes. Can you explain the Walmart? Yeah. Find that the um, stores that had protests right. before them, right. um, did they have any different rates of success for stores that opened without any protests? Um, we haven't actually sort of done that particular study. Um, you know, we actually hope to you know, do that. Yeah, but no. Uh, it, you know, um, for those of you who are interested in the statistical niceties of all of this, it turns out that these things are a little more kind of involved. In a regular experiment, what sort of happens is you neatly have a control, you neatly have an experiment, and then that's kind of that. Here, the treatment <coughs> is over time, right? And one of the problems is communities are self-selecting into the treatment and control conditions. There are all those kinds of issues. So what we do is we've actually borrowed lots of techniques from biostatisticians. So these are the people who are very concerned about these things. Uh, economists have done very interesting work as well, but in estimating some of these treatment effects, we've done that. But um, uh, the, the real kind of consequence of 
protests is how Walmart learns and how the protesters learn. Both are learning. So it's a learning race between kind of both of them. So that's the real big effect we're finding. Yes. Right. Uh, these principles really hold very, very true to those, uh, those efforts of sustainability also. Public right. opinion. Right. Um, you know, whether you're doing the right thing. Absolutely. Empowering people. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, that's so very true again. That's uh, so very true. It's kind of interesting how important it's public opinion is so important. In my own business school, I might add, uh, uh, you know, we're now moving to a LEEDS certified building. As, you know, all I know is as a faculty member, it's a nice new building, but my office is going to be far smaller. The footprint's <laughs> got to be smaller. Uh, and it's amazing, you know. Uh, uh, the, the students are very active. Uh, uh, you know, it's all about waste and, you know, so on. It's actually kind of very interesting how this has had a big effect uh, uh, on that. Uh, it, yes, uh, uh, you know, ideas that expand, if you will, the carbon footprint, the energy footprint, very quickly they get kind of selected out. Uh, you know, at least uh, uh, this is a big issue. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is actually a very difficult uh, uh, problem. Uh, the first thing I think is um, in our studies, the problem that we are finding is the people who do the selection, they're actually very diverse. Okay? So one simple marketing, finance, that kind of diversity or industry diversity. And in companies, we sort of have this nice theory, oh, it's a good thing to put diverse people together. And why do we want them? Because they're going to share their unique ideas, right? What you only know as a finance person, what I know as a marketing person or whatever. The thing, the real problem we observe when we see boards, when we see selection at the top level, is when you get a group of diverse people together, they actually don't talk about their unique knowledge. They only talk about their common knowledge. And it's amazing. You can go to a meeting. What is put on the table in the first three minutes, it doesn't matter if you extend the meeting to one hour. The same thing will be spoken again next week. So what matters is you've got to do things to put the unique things on the table. So in the little exercise that we do, uh, or that I do when I sort of do this, it's amazing how quickly unique knowledge gets suppressed. Because you think, hey, nobody else thinks this is a problem. Maybe it's not a problem. And you don't sort of talk about it. So very quickly, what can kind of happen is uh, the common knowledge gets endlessly kind of recirculated. And the big challenge is to actually make sure, and that to me is the heart of due diligence. Are we actually getting the unique knowledge there? And one of the ways in which I tell people to get the unique knowledge if you're selecting people at the senior levels is as managers and as executives, we aren't very good at forecasting the future. But we're pretty good at writing a story about something if we imagine as though it happened. So what I tell them is, hey, you're searching for CFO in 2009. Let's fast forward to 2012. Imagine you're writing a story as to why this person failed. So write a story about, and it's, a, it's like two pages. Or I tell another group, write a story about why this person succeeded. So you actually kind of have to put people into both conditions, the success condition and the failure condition. And it's actually kind of quite interesting, the stories that people write. And then once you kind of put them, that's a very easy way for the unique knowledge to kind of be put on the table. It's not enough to do it orally. Because you're not, am I making sense? I've actually found that to be a very effective but simple kind of way. I always tell people, you know, imagine this happened. You know, this person's a dud, failed completely. How did that happen? And all kinds of interesting stories kind of come, you know. And usually it has to do with, uh, you know, very interesting character issue, all kinds of things. You know, this person has a great need to be liked. 
and then can't say no, and all sorts of things follow from that. I mean, I'm giving you one example, but that's the way in which you sort of do things. What do you do if you're the candidate? Uh, it's a tough situation. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's a very tough situation, is all I can say. Because if you're off the radar screen, I mean, you haven't even got a fair hearing. Uh, we're right now, I can't mention specific details. Am I being, am I on, am I on tape here? Can you, 